back to today's session. This is the first session in the 2021 WBEX Coach Showcase. And for those of you who don't know what the Coach Showcase is, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview. Uh, so the WBEX Coach Showcase is an exclusive pro coach feature, which provides pro coach members with the opportunity to provide, to opportunity to apply and speak at the WBEX uh, full summit. So the coach showcase consists of seven sessions in total, and they are just added to the normal full summit schedule. And they're going to take place on the first Wednesday of the month. For the coach showcase this year, we received over 70 applications uh, from pro coach members, and the standard was extremely high. And myself and WBEX speaker Jonathan Wright, we made up the selection panel. And after much deliberation, uh, we managed to select our final seven speakers. So first of all, I'd love to congratulate uh, Samantha Hardy on being selected for the Coach Showcase. And I'm delighted to introduce her to you now uh, before I hand over to her for the session. So Samantha Hardy provides coaching, conflict support and training to leaders across the world. Sam is a certified transformative mediator by the US Institute of Conflict Transformation. She is also a certified narrative coach, an experienced conflict management coach, and the founder of the Real Conflict Coaching System. In 2021, Sam was awarded the Australian Resolution Institute Award for service to dispute resolution for her leadership and innovation. She has a PhD in law and conflict resolution and her newest book, Conflict Coaching Fundamentals, Working with Conflict Stories, has just been published by Routledge. And a fun fact about Sam is around 10 years ago, she spent six months living in a Buddhist temple working on a youth peace project. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Samantha Hardy. Sorry, folks, let me get my technology working. There we go. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to come along and speak today. I've been enjoying all the sessions and it was um, quite an honour to be chosen to actually present to everybody. So I'm speaking to you today from Perth, Australia. Um, I saw Caroline said she was calling in from Perth. And I wonder if that's Perth, Australia as well. It's in the evening here today, um, but I'm feeling quite full of energy. So hopefully I'll be able to stay awake and keep you awake for the session. I'm going to use um, a little slide inside my camera. So hopefully you can see this. The slides are going to be provided to you. So don't worry too much if you can't read it. I'm also going to show you a short video in a moment. Uh, the sound's not great for that, but we'll turn it, if you turn your audio up and keep an eye on the closed captions, that should work out okay. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk today about working with conflict stories. This is a, an area of which I'm very passionate about. I'm uh, a little bit obsessed with the power of stories and how they can support us to get our message across, or in the case of conflict, often they entrap us in a version of events that's not helpful for us or anyone else involved or observing the conflict. Uh, and this, a lot of what we talk about today is what's in the book that's just been released. Um, so if you're looking for more details, you can find that there. What I want to talk to you today is very briefly how conflict stories entrap us, how they are such a powerful way of limiting our perspectives and our options in all sorts of situations, but in conflict particularly so. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about my research into conflict stories and how I've discovered that there are two main types of conflict stories. One is a fairly typical one of my clients, the people who come to me because they're stuck in conflict and they're looking for some support. They're often telling themselves a story that leaves them no room to move. It leaves them no choice. So I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the attributes of that story. And I'm going to show you a, a person talking about conflict in that kind of form. But then I'm going to introduce to you what a constructive conflict story looks like. And then the most important part is to talk about the six main shifts that need to happen if you have a client who's stuck in a dysfunctional conflict story to help them shift into that more constructive space. So that's what we'll talk about today. So we make stories to give experience, to give meaning to what we experience. So someone, I think it was um, 
Jonathan Gottschall, who wrote a book called The Storytelling Animal, he talks about us not, not necessarily being human beings, but being hu human narrands or narrative. We use stories. That's part of what makes us um, unique as a species, our ability to create stories and share stories with one another to build connections. What I've discovered, and, and I, I think this is all sort of intuitively familiar to you, that we often fit our experiences to existing types or genres of stories. So we have these sort of typical stories, you know, the, um, the time I got lost story or that terrible family dinner story. You know, we all have those kind of types of stories, you know, a romance story. We all recognise a romance and we distinguish it from, you know, a horror story, for example. We have an intuitive understanding of the different types of stories that might be available to us. And certain types of experiences sort of evoke certain types of stories. And conflict is one of those experiences where we tend to fit into these two different categories of stories. The problem in conflict is that if we are starting to tell ourselves the dysfunctional version of, of the conflict story, the more we rehearse it by, you know, lying awake at night, thinking about it over and over again, and then telling it to our friends and family and anyone who wants to listen to us. As we rehearse our, our conflict story, it becomes more simplistic. We start to drop out facts that seem a bit superfluous or unnecessary or inconsistent with our version of events. They become very coherent. Um, we we make it make sense by reshuffling things, leaving things out, emphasising certain things and, you know, skimming over other things. And our stories become more rigid. And what that means is where we hold on to them really tightly. We're not actually that open to different perspectives or different ways of seeing things, which, as you can imagine, in conflict isn't a very helpful place to be. But the other thing is they become more real. We really start to believe that, that not that this is, a, a, and I think um, one of the other ladies who spoke recently in one of the WebEx presentations said, what, what is our story? We think is the story of the conflict. We, we deny that any other possible version of events exists. So it becomes reality to us. Um, but, it, but we forget that it's just our reality, not necessarily the reality or anybody else's reality. What I'm going to show you now is Angela's conflict story. So Angela is a former student of mine about 10, probably 15, 20 years ago now. Gosh, I asked a whole lot of my students and my former students if they'd be willing to come and be video just telling me about a conflict that they'd experienced. And I didn't interview them. I basically just set the camera rolling and said, tell me what happened. Tell me what, tell me about your conflict. Um, and Angela has given me permission to share this. Um, she, I check in with her fairly regularly and just say, is it still okay for me to show that video that we recorded all those years ago? And she always responds very generously with, go on, Sam, make me famous. Not sure it's exactly the kind of fame that, that you, most people would be looking for, but anyway. So this is a recording that was not scripted. I had no idea what she was talking about um, until she started telling me. It was um, a real life situation at the time. She's well past that now. Um, but I'm choosing this one out of all of the different stories to show you because I think it's an absolute sort of stereotype epitome of the dysfunctional conflict story. So the audio isn't great because, as I said, it was recorded in my university office with a very poor quality video camera about 15 years ago. Um, it will help if you turn your audio up a little bit to hear it and hopefully the closed captions will help as well. If you click on your screen, you should have a little closed caption button if you don't see that already, um, that should get most of what she says. Um, it goes for about five minutes. So, and, and again, most of my clients who come to see me with a conflict spend five to 10 minutes telling me about it until they're sort of looking for some kind of interaction. So this is fairly indicative of the sort of introduction that a client might give me to their conflict. So let's see how we go. Um, and Beth, pop in and tell me if there's any problem with people seeing and hearing this. Okay, I'm going to play it now. Well, my name is Angela and uh, thanks for seeing me today. Um, I'm here because I just have a really, um, that 
really bad conflict going on in my life at the moment and I don't know how to deal with it. Um, it's at my workplace where I'm working right now. Um, I have this um, colleague of mine who has been in this job for like 25 years and she knows like in and out of the organization by her fingertips and she's really good at what she does. And uh, in other circumstances, I would have got along with her perfectly well, but because I'm a newcomer in this role, I just have trouble dealing with her way of thinking. She sees me as a threat, and which is really discomfort, uh, discomforting because I don't want to be a threat to anyone, but she believes in experience and that's why she's been in this job for 25 years. And university I've got two degrees in my hand and she does not respect that at all because she thinks that experience weighs more than education and every day is a constant battle because I have to prove to her that I'm good in what I'm in what I'm doing and what I'm going to do but it's never enough for her and if I go to her for if I go to her for help especially in my regarding my work she just looks at me and she says oh don't they teach you at uni don't they teach this at uni or if i do something well which i think is good she they think she just says oh is this all they taught you at uni because and everything has the university the word university in it or my degrees in it and it clearly shows that she <clears throat> sees me as a threat and it clearly shows that you know she's threatened by what I have but at the same time she's trying to you know make me feel inferior to her and I don't know how to deal with it because I'm not here to please everyone but at the same time I can't waking up in the morning and going to work is a nightmare right now for me because I don't know how to deal with it. It's it's like a it's not a happy situation for me. And I think she's enjoying it because every time she says these things to me, she says it with a smirk. And the first, she's the one who did my induction process. And she had to show me to this is one of the examples. She had to show me to my desk and where I'll be seated for the rest of the, you know, rest of the time period of my employment. And the first thing, the first question she asked me was, uh, is this fine for you or do you want my desk and chair instead? Do you want my office instead? And I just looked at her and I'm like, I don't, how do you react to something like that? You know, you, you, and you think about all these like smart answers to cue back, but you don't because at that moment, you're in a horrible situation with this person. And I just stood there looking at her, tongue-tied, didn't know what to say. And I just told her, it's fine, thank you. I mean, I would have given it back to her. But at that moment, I was just tongue-tied. So it's, it's a nightmare. I just don't know what to do. It's, I wish I can get a solution to this because the only solution I can think of is you know, quit the job and don't do something which is not making you happy anymore. But do I really have to quit this job for someone who is not worth my time? Or how do I go ahead with this? Because there's absolutely no way I can talk to her about it because she's just going to be like, you know, she's going to ask me what did the teacher at uni how to deal with all these things. But I don't know. I'm just helpless here. So I know none of you, I assume none of you have heard the actual Angela tell her actual story that you just heard, but I'm wondering how many of you have heard that kind of story before, you know, the 
poor me, I'm a really good person, I've got these qualifications or fill in the gaps of whatever it is that the client values about themselves. This other person has come along or I've come across them in some way and they're challenging all those things that I hold, you know, valuable to me and they're doing it because they're a horrible person and there's no reason for it other than they're a horrible person and they've done this to me and they've done this to me and they've done this to me and absolutely the the Correct justice here is for that person to be taken away out of the place of employment or the family or wherever it is that the conflict's uh, taking place. And everything should go back to the way it should have been. You know, the day that I walked in the door in Angela's case with my two degrees in my hand, full of knowledge and enthusiasm for my new career, that this woman is now deliberately going out of her way to destroy for no reason other than that she's not a nice person. Have you heard that kind of story before? Angela's story for me fits what I call the melodrama of conflict. And one of the things that I've noticed about people who are stuck in that kind of dysfunctional conflict story, and I'll explain why it's dysfunctional in a moment, um, it, it fits the genre of melodrama. Now, when we talk about melodrama, we talk about things being melodramatic, a bit sensationalised. You know, there's often a soundtrack if we're talking about a film. But melodrama as a genre has some very specific traits and uh, these sort of conflict stories actually fit them really, really well. Let me show you a picture of what it sort of looks like. So this is what a melodramatic story kind of looks like. Firstly, it starts with um, an idealised kind of situation. So in classical melodrama, it was a beautiful heroine who was, you know, in love and about to get married, usually something like that. Then the bad guy comes along and each of the events in the story are the bad guy doing something bad to the heroine, something that challenges her virtue. Now, in classical melodrama, virtue was all about the legitimacy of birth and virginity and the, the main character was always a young, you know, virtuous female. Clearly in modern day conflict it's more complicated than that we're not usually having conflicts over virginity or legitimacy of birth and obviously all people in conflict aren't young females but there are some similarities um, people who are stuck in this kind of conflict story do tend to adopt some feminine typically feminine kinds of traits and in some ways that could explain but I'm getting off onto a whole nother topic why men sometimes don't want to seek help with conflict because it because they have to kind of emasculate themselves they have to kind of admit that they're not that handling it as a man should handle conflict whereas women are, are much more likely to seek assistance because it's kind of culturally acceptable so we have this idealized past um, where everything was great the future was going to be fantastic in Angela's case she was going to have this fantastic career she's as I said well qualified and full of enthusiasm and motivation and she gets along with people and then this woman comes along in her new workplace and says something horrible to her at the induction process, which seems a little bit out of context. Like, it's, I mean, maybe this woman is a kind of a sociopath or something, but more than likely there's a backstory to it. There's some explanation for it that's not in Angela's version of events. So we have this weird induction event where she says, is that okay for you to want my desk and chair? And then we have the university comments, the didn't they teach you that at uni? sort of comments and then there's this obstacle that the villain in this case this other woman is creating which is preventing the dream justice which as you can see by this kind of simplistic um diagram looks just like the idealized past so dream justice for Angela was what she'd imagined when she turned up to start work that she was going to be this valued employee and get along with people and be supported by her colleagues but in a way, it's a return to the past. So in melodrama, there's also this figure here who's the father figure. And he, in, in classical melodrama, is responsible for figuring out what's actually going wrong, sort of identifying that the villain is actually an evil villain and then getting rid of the villain and sort of rewarding or, or um, recompensing, I suppose, the, the wronged heroine and putting things back to the way they should be. So this is kind of classical melodrama. Just as a little bit of an aside, another interesting attribute of melodrama, the, the main character in classical melodrama was often mute because they'd taken a vow of silence or they were put somewhere in a dungeon where no one could hear them, but they effectively had no way to speak up and defend themselves or to stand up for themselves, to speak up for themselves. And Angela demonstrates a modern equivalent of that very well, where she says when the woman's making the comments about induction, she says 
she had all these smart replies in her head and she wanted to give it back to her, but she, she was tongue tied. She didn't say, I thought it was maybe not a good idea to call her, you know, insert various swear words. Um, she said she couldn't, she was tongue tied. And later on, she says, there's absolutely no way I can talk to her. She presents it as an impossibility, not it would be hard or I'm a bit concerned about how it would go or I feel unprepared about that or I'm not confident to have that conversation. She says, there is absolutely no way I can talk to her about it. So that's a super crash course on melodrama. I am going very quickly because I can talk a lot and an hour is not a long time for me. Um, this is what reality looks like. So in reality, the past is usually imperfect. It's not all that it's cracked up to be. A classic example of this, I used to be a litigation lawyer like a long time ago, 25 years ago now. Um, I didn't do it for very long, five years. And I had a woman who had a back injury at work. She was claiming damages from her employer because she had been put in an unsafe situation causing the injury. And we had to list all the ways that she was suffering to sort of back up her claim for compensation. And she said to me, I can't even vacuum anymore. I can't even vacuum. Like, it just makes me feel like a terrible wife and a mother because I can't pay someone to vacuum my house for me. And it's just, I just wish I could vacuum. And I thought, really? I mean, I get that. I get that it's a little bit of an, you know, it's an expense to pay someone to vacuum your house. But I'm sure if I'd spoken to you before the accident and said, how do you feel about vacuuming your house? You would have said, oh, gosh, I wish someone else would do it for me. You know, I really hate vacuuming. It's my least favourite chore. But in this story, you have to present the past, this idealised state that the villain has ruined, um, as this sort of ideal. So you, it means that we're a little bit unrealistic about where we start from and also then where we end because in the melodramatic story, the ending looks just like the beginning, which also means there's no growth, no learning, no innovation, no development. We go back to the way it was before. But what you'll also see in this version of events there's a whole lot of other things going on around the main events that Angela in this case has talked about. So there would be other conversations, there'll be other people who are either engaged in conversations with Angela or with the other woman who notice she doesn't have a name, she's like a stereotypical villain. Um, they might be just observing. That's the other thing in, in when we're stuck in that dysfunctional conflict, it's all about us and the bad guy. We forget that there are other people around who are perhaps contributing, perhaps just observing, perhaps if we're talking about children um, being impacted by this conflict in a way that's not really fair for them. And we recognise that this outcome, which in melodrama, the outcome is usually one of us has to go. One of us is good, one of us is bad, and the bad one has to go. That's not usually realistic. In most conflicts, that isn't the outcome and that's never possible. Sometimes it is possible, but it often comes with side effects or, you know, consequences that are not that good. But what these complex versions of events give us is multiple choices for action. And choices are hard. If choices, it's much easier if we have a father figure who comes in and sorts it out for us and we just kind of sit around going, poor me, poor helpless, virtuous me, and someone else has the responsibility of dealing with it. But if we can acknowledge complexity, open up choices, and then be brave enough to make a choice, then we have we're empowered, we, you know, we, have, we have the capacity to learn and grow and develop. And even if the outcome isn't great, even if we do have very limited choices, at least we can feel like we made one, we knew it wasn't great, and we're going to learn and grow and hopefully avoid putting ourselves in that situation uh, later. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but I'm going to leave you with something to think about just to kind of, I don't know, get you, get you curious perhaps. It turns out that the genre that I found fit best this constructive conflict story was tragedy. Now, that doesn't sound um, in intuitively right, does it? Because we think about tragedy as life sucks and then you die kind of situation. You make some terrible mistake because you've got a fatal flaw and you ruin your own life. I talk about these constructive stories as tragedy with a twist, they're, they're like tragedy because there's complexity, there's uncertainty, no one's going to ride in them, they're white horse in shining armour and save you. You have to figure it out yourself as best you can. It's not going to be perfect. 
but at, you do have an opportunity perhaps to avoid making that choice based on your fatal flaw. Perhaps if you come to conflict coaching early enough, um, you'll recognize that, you know, the flaw that's maybe underpinning some of the choices that you've made so far. And you might have an opportunity to twist the ending. You might have an opportunity to turn it into something better than, you know, dying and learning that lesson way too late. Um, sometimes, honestly, clients come to me and it is too late to, to fix things or to manage things effectively. And they do just have to learn from their mistakes. But I, I like to talk about it as being tragedy with a twist. Hopefully we get them early enough to help them make a choice early enough that, that twists the ending into something much better than life sucks and you die. So this is what, what the really important stuff is, though. How do we get people who are stuck in that very simplistic, narrow version of events where they're the helpless victim, where they've been kind of their life's being destroyed by the bad guy? How do we get them to move into a version of events that's more self-reflective, that's more open to possibilities, the possibility that there's other versions of events, this, the, get them to pay attention to things that they've not been paying attention to because they've been stuck in this narrow version of events. They've forgotten that they know all this other stuff that might be really useful to them in managing this situation better. So I summarise the six main shifts. Now, I talk about them as a shift from melodrama to tragedy, um, but I don't have time to expand on all of that now. But I'm going to give you the six main shifts and a couple of um, pointers for each of them. So this is something that you can take and use in a very practical sense if you've got clients who are in conflict situations. Okay, the first one is the shift from simplicity to complexity. We want to help people shift from a very simplified version of events to a more complex version of events. And in a way, this is the most important shift and the easiest shift to get clients to make because all we need to do is ask them to tell us more, to ask them to give us more detail, to ask questions about what happened before that induction conversation. What, what, tell me about other conversations you've had with her. Tell me a bit more about her. You just ask in a very curious manner for a whole lot of information that sort of fills out the gaps and the holes in that story. Now, we obviously want to do it in a way that doesn't sort of imply that their story is wrong or that they're missing information or that they've made assumptions. We don't want to judge them, but we want to curiously find out as much as we can so that in a, in a sense we're saying to them, I really want to understand what it's been like for you and how you've got to this place. But actually what we're doing is saying to them, I want you to think more carefully. I want you to pay attention to all the things that you do already know but that haven't featured in your story and that it sort of got lost along the way but it's still there somewhere you can still access them so asking about more detail that to sort of fill out the plot a little bit of history is useful what happened before the first sort of event the first evil thing that the evil villain did to you what's happened in between the reported events and some context um, so asking a little bit about, tell me a little bit about where you work in Angela's case, who are the other people that work there, you know, what are they like, um, might reveal quite useful information. For example, it might turn out that this woman is the oldest person in the organisation, the only person without a degree. There are a lot of younger people coming in who have one or two degrees who are very tech savvy. She's feeling a little bit nervous, you know, that, that sort of information could change our perception and maybe Angela's perception of what's actually going on here. It might turn out not to be about Angela at all. Um, the third point there, ask for specific examples. So the other thing that people do in conflict is they overgeneralize and they're very good at telling us what the bad guy did but they talk about how they suffered. So they say, and she did that to me and it made me feel and then she did this to me and it made me feel. So one of the things they don't talk about very much is what they've done, the choices they've made, the replies that they've given. I had a client once who had had a relationship with a guy at work and they'd broken up and it got really ugly. And she complained that he'd been sending her numerous emails and text messages that were really offensive and upsetting to her. And she rattled off to me lots of them, telling me what he'd said and all these terrible, and they were pretty nasty. And every time I said to her, what, what did you do when you got that message? Oh, I felt terrible. I was just felt sick. She, she kept telling me how she felt. And I had to ask her a couple of times, but eventually she said, 
oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I reply. I'm like, okay, so how many of those would you reply to? All of them. Okay, should we have a look at the replies? And I'm not saying that she um, created the problem, but, but there was a lot more going on and her emails weren't all that flattering or polite either. Um, and there was maybe different choices that she could have made back in, in those earlier interactions. So ask for specific examples. You, you want to feel like you've watched the movie. Um, and again, it's not for us to understand, it's to help the client to understand differently in, in more complexity and understand that there's probably a lot more going on here. And at this point in time, we're not doing this for any particular purpose. We're not trying to solve the problem, figure out what's actually going on or get the client to see things from someone else's perspective. Or there's a helicopter going right over my roof right now. Sorry if you can hear that, it's quite loud. Um, all we want to do is to help the client look under the rocks and nooks and crannies in their story and collect more information for no particular purpose at the moment other than to gather more information that they already know. And you'd be surprised how much detail can come out. Um, ask for more detail about the characters. So what do we know about them? Who else is involved? Who's impacted and observing? Um, one of the things that we talk about in conflict is it's really important to see things from person's perspective but if we don't pay attention to what we know about them then we're seeing it from their perspective in our sort of filtered version of them as a stereotypical vi villain whereas if we get the client to talk about what they know about that person and just describe them you know what do they know about them what do they like how do they interact with other people what do they like what do they not like you know when are they at their best at work when are they at their worst those sorts of things help create a foundation for taking someone else's perspective that's based on a, a more nuanced appreciation of them. Okay, I'm rushing because I've got five more to go through in not that much time. The second one, and this often happens kind of incidentally when we increase the complexity of the client's story, is to move them from a sense of certainty to a sense of uncertainty. Now, as we complexify the story, as I said, that often happens kind of naturally because the, so the story is no longer as simple as coherent. There's a whole lot of other things going on that can make the client sort of second guess some of their assumptions or their certainties. This requires a really good trusting relationship and a safe space for the client to get through this uncertainty. This is not an easy sort of transition to make because when you're certain, well, when you're certain you are right, when you are certain you are the good guy and the other guy's the bad guy, it feels good. You don't want to let go of that. And sometimes when we complexify the story and we shift people into uncertainty, a couple of things happen. They question themselves. Did I do the right thing? Am I actually a nice person? Maybe I do have uh, have contributed to this in some way. Wow, now what? It, I, I thought I knew what the answer was and now it's not so straightforward. This can be quite disconcerting. So you have to do this in a very kind of safe environment but we want to help the client to understand that their story of the conflict isn't the story of the conflict and we want to encourage uncertainty not to make them feel bad or stupid or worried but to encourage curiosity about other perspectives about what else they might not know that might be useful to know maybe even they might get inspired to go and ask some questions or gather some more information which is always a fantastic thing to do in conflict we also want to highlight opportunities for the client to recognize that there might be things they don't know and clients often say things like oh, I don't know what he was thinking but seriously and as soon as I hear a client say that, I jump on it. Oh, so you don't know what he was thinking. Tell me more about that. So highlighting whenever they express uncertainty is actually quite useful. It doesn't necessarily make them feel good, but it's useful for them to recognise that there are things that they don't know. In conflict, what often happens when I do mediations and I put people together they share information with each other that they weren't expecting. And then all of a sudden the conflict is different from what they thought when they arrived, or sometimes it disappears altogether and they realise that they were just on different wavelengths and there is actually no conflict. Um, certainty is a really dangerous place to be in conflict, but it's what people come into you with when they're in that melodramatic story. 
Uh, this third point, ask the client when they recognise some uncertainty or an unknown, ask them what difference it would make if you knew the answer to that or if you knew for sure and how you might find out, how they might find that out. And I love this phrase, rather than, than trying to take someone else's perspective, see if there's a way that you can build communication so that you can get it, you can ask it and they will give it to you. It's much more constructive. It's then going to be much more accurate, assuming people feel confident to tell you actually what's going on in their minds or what information they know. Um, so taking someone else's perspective is useful, but if you can create an environment where you can ask and they will give it to you, that's even better. Um, and again, you can ask clients directly what other information might exist that they don't know about. Um, and even if they can't name something, which they probably can't because they, then they would know about it, um, it makes them realise that there could be more out there, that the other person might have some very important information that they don't know about and could absolutely change things. Um, here's the third one. From passive to active. Now, in the melodramatic conflict story, you're kind of rewarded for being passive because if you don't do anything, you can't do anything wrong. Um, and, and if you're in melodrama and you've got a father figure coming in to save you, you don't have to do anything. Someone else will sort it out for you. You just sit there and be virtuous and it'll all be okay. But, but it's not very constructive. In, re in real life, you don't usually have a knight in shining armour father figure coming in to save you and being passive actually works against you in the long run. And it can create a situation of kind of learned helplessness if it goes on for too long. So one of the things that we can do is highlight examples of where the client has been active in the past. And so I talk about choices. So I help the client recognise where they have made choices before. It often doesn't feel like they've made a choice. When Angela said, it's fine, thank you, to the woman doing the induction process with her, she felt tongue-tied. She felt that was the only thing she was able to say. But actually, she made a choice not to say the smart replies that were in her head. It didn't feel like a choice at the time. But I can reframe that back to her by saying, you know, when you said that to, to the woman, let's call her Georgia because it's really hard to keep talking about her without a name. When you said that to Georgia, when you said that's fine, thank you, what, what did you really want to say that you felt you couldn't say? And, you know, Angela might say something quite offensive, you know, how dare you, you stupid expletive, talk to me like that. Who do you think you are? Um, and often when you give clients the opportunity to say what they would really have liked to have said if there were no consequences, they kind of enjoy saying it and then they laugh a little bit. And so I'll often say to them, why, why, is it, why are you laughing when you say that? What's the laugh about? And very often they'll say, well, of course, I wouldn't say that because you just you don't say things like that in the workplace. Like it's completely inappropriate. And then you can say as the coach, so you made a great choice not to say what was in your head. And what you said was definitely better than that, right? Now, that's not to say that there might not have been an even better choice in hindsight, but at the time you made a smart choice between what was in your head and what you actually said, which was polite, if not, you know, perhaps getting across the message that you wanted to get across at the time. So we want to look for opportunities to highlight clients' actions, clients' choices in the past. And in doing so, it also kind of changes the client's mindset. They start to think, oh, maybe I have some choices in the future as well. Yeah, I have made some choices there. I wasn't just acted upon. In some cases, doing nothing is a choice. You chose not to say anything or you chose not to escalate that complaint. Um, and then as we're moving into the future part of the process, we would encourage the client to look for opportunities to act. What are some things that you might be able to do that might improve the situation for you? Let's assume that we can't magically make the other person disappear or magically find some manager or important person to come in and solve it for you. What are some things that you might be able to do to improve the situation? So we encourage them to take some sort of action. It, it might not be enough to solve the problem, to give them dream justice, but it's a step in the right direction. This is closely related, but it's a slightly different point. We want to help the client shift from a, a feeling of being dependent on someone to save them and a sense of agency that they have some control over their own future. 
And the problem with being a rescuer, if you really want to help people and save them, it's very easy to fall into that father figure role, to tell people what they should do or try to help them and save them. And yes, that might be great if you, if you have the capacity to do that in the short term. But what that does, if, if the person keeps getting saved, they never learn the agency to look after themselves. And one day someone is not going to be there to save them and they're not going to have the skills or the confidence to manage it themselves. So we want to reinforce the client's agency wherever possible. And we can do that in a number of ways. Don't do anything for the client that the client can do themselves. If you're um, thinking, oh, it might be helpful to summarise what we've talked about today, instead of you doing it, say to the client, what are the main things you think that we've talked about so far? Or remind me what you, what you thought you might be able to do. Um, so ask the client to make choices and have some agency in the coaching process and set them up for that when they leave the coaching room, the coaching space, and go out into the real world, get them into a sense of agency. Um, I should just say quickly as well, there's a figure in melodrama called, who's like the bumbling helper and he is usually someone who's completely devoted to the heroine but he's really practically useless. So he bumbles around talking about how virtuous the heroine is. No one really listens to him because he's not particularly powerful but he's there for her and he really keeps believing in her and when she feels like everybody else might be against her, he is there for her, by her side, supporting her even if he's kind of practically use, useless. That's the role I want to play as a coach. I want to be there for her. I mean, I don't really want to be practically useless because I think by going through the coaching process, I am actually quite helpful. But I want to present to the client in the way that I'm practically useless. There's nothing I can do directly. Talking and see if you can figure something out, you know, because you're a smart person, right? So I'm there for them. I'm encouraging them, but I'm not doing it for them. I'm sort of that humble, humble helper. Okay, here's the next one, past and future. As I mentioned briefly earlier, in melodrama, the ending looks just like the beginning. Everything goes back to the status quo, the way it was before the villain came along and ruined everything. What we want to do is stop the client focusing on the past, a return to the past. We want them to learn from the past, but we want them to bounce forward, not bounce back, right? Everyone talks about you've got to bounce back. No, actually, let's bounce forward. Let's do better than what we started with. Let's learn from this experience, the good bits and the bad bits, and let's use it to do better than where we started from. So bouncing forward, not going back to the past. Learn from the past, use it to bounce forward. And also help the client to realise that you can't go back to the idealised past, even if the bad guy miraculously resigns. I'm mean, using workplace examples a lot because Angela's is a workplace one. Miraculously resigns or the manager decides that she is actually not a great um, employee and so she, her, she's made redundant or whatever. And suddenly, in theory, Angela is in this space where she'd imagined she should be. Other people have seen this play out. Other people have observed the interactions. A manager might have not been impressed by the way that Angela managed it. Maybe they didn't think she was assertive enough or maybe they thought she complained to other colleagues in the, in the tea room too much. Other colleagues would have seen it. Angela is probably going to have a trigger whenever anyone mentions her university degrees in the future. There's no going back. There has been water under the bridge. Let's help the client recognise that and learn and grow from it. So reinforcing a future focus that learns from the past rather than goes back to the past. Uh, and this is um, the last one, and I think this is a really interesting one. Helping people shift from a focus on their suffering, which is also what people in the melodramatic um, conflict story do. They focus a lot on their suffering not denying that they're suffering, but learning from it. So, and I know this sounds very Buddhist, given that I spent that six months in the Buddhist temple, um, and it's a bit Viktor Frankl, you know, it's the same kind of ideas, I suppose, but help the client to understand that a life without any suffering is an unachievable ideal. Let's be optimistic, but not idealistic. Let's not Pretend that suffering can be completely alleviated, that, that going to work is always going to be full of supportive colleagues and, um, you know, who respect and value your education and who, that you'll get along with everybody. Whatever 
context we work in, there are going to be moments that are not pleasant that make us suffer. What we can do though is learn to manage our suffering, learn to work through our suffering and to learn and grow from it. So we want to encourage our clients to develop resilience in the face of adversity. What happens if we make these shifts? So we help a client make these shifts. So they come in in that melodramatic Angela version of events and suddenly they realise there are a couple of things that have happened that, that they could have done differently that might have, you know, alleviated some of their suffering along the way, that might have changed the relationship they had with this person so that it didn't escalate so far or go on for so long. If we can help people make these shifts, this is what happens. Firstly, they have a more constructive conflict mindset. They are open to different ideas about how to manage and potentially resolve the conflict than this dream justice that the bad guy's got to go and I need to be kind of rewarded for all this suffering. They have a more realistic and nuanced version of events, which means they have more information to use to come up with creative ideas about how to manage it in the future. They recognise that there may be unknowns and this hopefully leads to an openness to new information, some new perspectives and curiosity. Curiosity is a magic, magic thing to experience in conflict. It's a very helpful place to be. They're increasingly willing to engage in the conflict in trying to manage it better and potentially resolve it and contribute to improving the situation and they recognise that they will have choices along the way and that they are capable of making choices even though sometimes they're not easy. Sometimes the choice might be between a rock and a hard place but they recognise that making a choice is better than just sitting around and waiting for someone to make it for you or to save you. Um, they have increased confidence and courage to manage conflict now and into the future. Hopefully what they do from learning from their past experience is learning what they might do differently next time. And it's not just like running a training course where they learn abstract principles, you know, use when you did that, I felt kind of statements. They learn from their own experiences. So it's, it's just in time, individually tailored learning based on their own experiences, their own conflict triggers, their own typical responses. They learn a lot about themselves and how they in, interact with others through challenging situations. And that can be really, really constructive. And they are increasingly resilient. So they're ready to manage conflict into the future. They're a little bit less scared of it in the future because they start to understand it a little bit better and themselves. Um, oh, I think I've just finished in time. <laughs> um, a lot of what I talked about today, particularly unpacking the melodrama and tragedy side of things is in my book. Um, but that's pretty much it. And I'm really happy to take questions. I haven't kept an eye on the Q&A or the chat. Um, so Beth, <laughs> I'll um, just get rid of this and maybe we can see what people have to say. Perfect timing, Sam. We've still got 10 <laughs> minutes left to dive into some questions. So yeah, amazing timekeeping there. And um, wow, just want to say what a fantastic session filled with amazing practical tips for coaches to help their clients deal with conflict. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of those. Um, yeah, we are going to take some questions in just a second. And first, I just wanted to mention that we will be sharing a survey right at the end of this session. Uh, the survey is going to be, it's, it just automatically pops up when you leave Zoom. Uh, so we'd greatly appreciate if you could take a few moments to share your input on Sam's session today when you leave the webinar. Okay, Sam, let's take some questions. Um, just so many amazing comments um, coming into the Q&A box as well, Sam, this content really resonating with people. Um, okay, so first question comes from Karen. And she says, how do you know when a person is too fatigued or in the victim mode for so long that they might not have the energy to move forward? Yeah, I think it's a really good question because there are times when people have been have been victimized. You know, if, if you actually work under a, a real legitimate bully or you're in a violent situation where you have been victimized for a long period of time, then they're probably not going to be able to be coached out of that situation. Um, and sometimes being more assertive in that situation can be more dangerous for them. So I think mm. 
um, that is one of the things that I'd be looking out for when I was deciding whether or not coaching might be suitable for a client is whether I felt that they had the capacity um, to move out of that victim role uh, and whether it was safe for them to do so. So I think it's probably a question for what I might do in intake. Um, and I mean, it's hard to say where on that sliding scale <laughs> it's worth giving it a try and whether you might make more create more harm than good but I think it's a really good question that you need to be careful about um, clients who may need a father figure who actually might need to be saved because they actually have lost the capacity not that they've sort of they've forgotten about it but they might actually have lost it for various reasons out of the situation or their own personal response to trauma significant trauma for example um, and probably they're the clients that I'd be referring to someone like a psychologist and perhaps mm. a lawyer to protect them yeah yeah well, that's really interesting thank you um a question from Elspeth. So she says, do you see similarities to people feeling stuck in their historical context? Uh, for example, if you grew up in a culture associated with fear, distrust, punishment, etc., that kind of thing. Yes. And I guess in some way that might be what I would describe in, in a tragic genre as your fatal flaw. A fatal flaw can sometimes be something that's part of your personality, but can sometimes be something that's developed through your upbringing. And it could be in a conflict context, I'd say a, a fatal flaw is more like a trigger or a pattern of behaviour that gets you into trouble, that doesn't serve you in the way that you think it might when you use it. Um, in Brene Brown's words, it might be a shield that you're using rather than a, an effective boundary to manage a challenging situation. Um, so yeah I think I've got distracted but I think I think you could do some work on that but I think the problem with I would probably again refer someone who is really stuck in a historical context to a therapist who would do mm. a lot of work unpacking that kind of inbuilt stuff that's developed in what I do with my co conflict coaching clients is learn from fairly immediate past with a bit of acknowledgement of those triggers and then move forward to a practical kind of action plan afterwards. So I guess, again, that would be the tension. If it was too embedded because of historical context, someone like a therapist might be a more useful um, service. Yeah, yeah, no, makes sense. So Kat is asking, uh, how many conversations does it take to help the person move forward with every situation? Uh, she says, in her understanding, it takes time to train the mind towards creating a new habitual pattern of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. So when I when I teach our um, real conflict coaching model, we say this the standard kind of intervention is six sessions. Um, okay. But someone like Angela could have a complete mind shift about this situation with Georgia in one session and in fact I did do some coaching with Angela and in one session she totally changed her perspective of what was driving George's behavior and the whole thing kind of disappeared and they ended up having a really lovely relationship mm. um, so one session can make a big difference six sessions I would say would be about average for an average kind of conflict where I would consider doing a longer um, sequence of sessions might be if it's a very entrenched conflict, it's been going on for a really long time, or there's some sort of habitual patterns of behaviour that have been getting this person into trouble in various conflicts in their lives. And we might pick one as an example to unpack. Um, I think the thing that's really important, and I think this is the same with all coaching, but particularly with conflict coaching, we want to help people manage the conflict that they're in now, definitely. Mm. But we also want to build their capacity. I talk about competence and confidence, their skills and their courage to manage future conflict. And that capacity building part can take longer if someone's been in bad habits, you know, bad conflict habits for a while. But you'd be surprised how much can happen in one or two sessions in terms of mm. managing the specific conflict. So I would say six sessions is about what I would generally work with clients in conflict but when I work with leaders who are improving their sort of conflict leadership then we might do it as a much longer term kind of developmental exercise rather than a short term help the person develop enough capacity to manage the conflict more effectively on their own and sort of set them free so it's that tension between being the permanent helper and building their capacity to be the hero of their own future I noticed a few people saying the hero's journey and that's kind of where we're aiming mm. with, yeah yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, 
Joanne is asking, how aware are the clients about being in the story, so to speak? Um, and do you experience resistance or denial? Yes, I guess one of the things I should say, I don't say to the clients, oh, you're being that innocent victim in the melodramatic story. You know, you need to toughen mm. up and become a tragic hero. I don't use that language with them. I use that understanding to uh, notice parts of their story where there's likely to be some work to be done. So I think the thing is, if I'm th being their bumbling helper or they're, you know, they're not devoted in the sense that I'm in love with them, uh, as in classical melodrama, but if I'm really interested and I'm really trying to understand what it's been like to be them and I'm asking lots of questions from a curious, supportive um, standpoint, then I don't get a lot of resistance. Um, I do get resistance if I've got a client who maybe is sent to me by an employer and they don't really want to be there or they, what their employer wants them to do with them, what they want to do. What I can do with those clients is say, tell me about that. What, why does that really bother you? If you could choose what you wanted to do, what would you want to do? And then I ask a whole lot of questions about that and how they've got in this situation yeah. where their boss wants them to do something that they don't and then we're rolling again. So I think there are ways to avoid that resistance if you don't challenge them too much or at least not too early. Mm. It's not to say I wouldn't challenge them, but not too early. And Beth, I noticed a couple of people said I should speak more slowly and I agree <laughs> and I apologise. I was desperate to try and get this done <laughs> on time, but that is certainly one of my fatal flaws. I get very excited and off I go very fast. So I apologise for that, but you will get a transcript and that might help to, to review it later. <laughs> yes, yes. No, don't worry, Sam. You, you timed it to perfection. You really did. Um I have a question as well. So do you use the melodrama kind of, you know, that model or that metaphor with your clients? Do you kind of position it to them to say like, you are this person like in, in this story sort of thing, or, or is that just something that you yeah. keep private? I might as, as, um, as once we've had a bit of rapport building and trust, and I would say over a number of sessions, I might talk mm. about it a little bit more. I might ask them, you know, if, if this was a fairy tale, what character mm. would you be and what character would the other person be and, you know, what would be the logical outcome of the story? And then let's say we try to tell exactly the same story as a comedy what would happen then? You know, so you can actually yeah. use playing around with genres yeah. as a bit of an activity um, to help people shift their mindset. Um, but I, um, I'm careful about introducing it too early because people feel judged. If you tell them, oh, you're stuck in that melodramatic story and you're playing yeah. innocent victim, they're immediately offside. So you've got to be gentle, gentle and get on side and walk along with them before you perhaps point out things that they need to have a harder <laughs> look at. <laughs> before the conflict arises in the coaching session That's right. as well. That's right. Yeah. All right, Sam. Well, that, that brings us to the end of today's session. Um, just so many amazing comments coming in through the Q&A box. Um, you know, just people very appreciative of everything that you've shared and that they can kind of take into their own practices. So thank you so much. Um, for everybody who's still on the call, before we go, I just want to quickly run through how you can keep the conversation going and also get involved um, with more kind of conflict management content from Sam. Um, so as you know, we have the WBEX community, which we launched in the pre-summit back in June. And in the community, we have areas called coaching spaces. And these are uh, groups in the community that are dedicated to specific topic areas. One of those spaces that we just opened up is conflict management. And so we encourage you to hop over into the conflict management space to continue the conversation on Sam's session. So you can click the link in the chat box to take you to the conflict management space. And there you'll see Sam's session post. So it's just the same post as the normal full summit sessions, but we've just moved it into the conflict management space instead of the full summit area instead. And um, so when you're there, you can click the join space button to become a member of that space. And then you can access all of the content that's going to be posted in there in future. Um, and Sam herself is going to be one of the curators for this space. And she's going to be putting lots of amazing content in there over the next few weeks. So if you did want to keep up with Sam's work um, and this amazing model, then um, yeah, please head over there and, and keep on kind of looking back to it to see what content is being posted there in the coming weeks. Um, 
Finally, the implementation mastery sessions, there are a couple taking place um, in one hour's time just after this session. Um, and today the sessions are being offered in English and Portuguese. So if you are interested in continuing the conversation, then please join an IM session and the link to do so is in the chat box for you now. Um, and finally, just a reminder to please submit your feedback on Sam's session when you leave the webinar as well. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, we hope to see you again on the full summit sessions tomorrow. We have Erica Duan at 9 a.m. And then we have Michelle Tillis Lederman at 5 p.m. Eastern as well. Um, so we we'll hope to see you there. Sam, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and yes, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you on the sessions tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you.